Welcome to this session of the Beyond the Veil Summit, where we'll explore the nature of the veil between the worlds. I'm Lisa Bonis, and my guest for this session is Marie Monacheri. Our topic today is what happens to your loved ones once their energy leaves the body? Marie Monacheri, RN, is an internationally known intuitive healer, speaker, author, and teacher. Her compassionate presence allows people to heal their wounds and emerge into expanded consciousness. And along with her private practice, she offers workshops, retreats, and hosts a popular radio show where energy and medicine meet. Marie is the author of Intuitive Self-Healing and How to Communicate with Your Spirit Guides, released by Sounds True. Marie, thank you so much for joining us today. It's so good to see you again. Welcome. Thank you, Lisa. It's wonderful to be here. One of my favorite topics of all time and your joy. So uh, thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I, I, I really do enjoy talking with you. And I know uh, the last time we spoke, we weren't really talking about uh, this topic. We were talking about other things. So let's, let's, let's dig in here. I'm always curious to hear people's stories, like when and how did you become aware of your mediumship gifts? Because it's, it's different for everybody. It is. Uh, well, everything happened to me, honestly, while working at a, at a hospital. I was an oncology nurse at a Sierra, Seattle area hospital. I was already doing energy work on my patients, and I was very blessed to be highly supported by the staff there. Physicians sometimes would order me, could you go do that thing that you do, that you do on Mrs. Johnson this morning? And um, I was a charge nurse, so I was really busy. I would have like three pagers on my waist. And sometimes I would say, no, I can't. And they would go, okay, well, I'm gonna write an order for therapeutic touch. And then I would have to go in and, and you know, take some time out and work with their patient, which was of course a pleasure. But that's actually um, how I began to see people on the other side. I was in the hospital. I was a charge nurse again that day. I was walking down a large corridor. It was very early in the morning. Um, all the other nurses were in report and I was waiting for them to come on the floor so we, I could help them because that's really what the charge nurse does. And I heard this woman's voice very loudly, almost in a pleading sense, could you please go talk to my son? And I looked around the room and there was nobody or, or the corridor, there was nobody in the hallways, which was kind of weird in itself. Like there was no x-ray technician or pharmacist, there was no doctor. And the corridors in the hospital I worked in were huge. And I was kind of standing in this in the middle of a, where a whole bunch of corridors came into one another. So I had a good viewpoint of multiple entry points to the floor I was on. And I looked around and no one was there and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to start walking into these, hosp these hospital rooms where hopefully our patients are sleeping and our patients were very ill. They were all in-house cancer patients. They were getting chemo, some of them all through the night. And um, as I was about, as I turned to walk towards a hospital room to investigate where this voice was coming from, I heard it again. And at the same time, the foot that I was stretching to continue my walk, it felt like it ran up against a wall, like it stopped. And I was already having many, many multi-sensory experiences every single day since I had started uh, doing energy work in the hospital. Um, so I knew at that point, oh, this voice probably is not human. This is probably a being, you know, in the non-physical realm. And then my vision went up and I could see this really beautiful blue, like fabric. I'm highly clairvoyant. I'm kind of spinning around um, near the ceiling. And I saw this woman's face um, kind of contorted come out of the blue fabric. And she said, could you please speak to my son? And I probably wasn't as compassionate as I could, could have been at the time. I was tired. I was getting a divorce. I had three children. I had this emerging practice at home. I was working full time as, a, as an oncology nurse. And I said, I can't. I, I, I don't even know who she was talking. There was many beds on the unit. So what happened the rest of the, of the day is every time I'd walk that stretch of the hallway, she would ask me again. And towards the end of the afternoon, her voice was so pleading. I, I all of a sudden, I must have re released my resistance, you know, because there was a door in the hallway that kind of started to glow. And then I went, oh, her son is in that room. 
Um, so I went into the room. I first asked the nurse that was assigned to him, it was a, a gentleman, uh, if I could go in there because everybody already knew I was weird by then, you know, on the hospital floor. But I always asked the other nurses permission before I worked on their clients' patients because I always wanted to work on people that I didn't know their history or their diagnosis because I was building an encyclopedia in my brain about what energy and health looks like or illness. Luckily, the nurse said, yes, please. I walk into this room and there's a gentleman in bed, young, like in his 40s. To me, that's young now. And um, there was a woman sitting next to him who at the time I assumed was his wife. I, and I introduced myself to him and I said, because I assumed maybe this was his mother. I said, is your mother deceased? And he said, yes. And I said, would you consider her pushy? And he just burst out laughing and so did the woman next to him and she introduced herself and it was his sister. And he, they both just laughed and I said, well, your mother's been screaming at me all day and she wants me to talk to you. I don't know what it is that she wants me to say, but can I lay my hands on you? So he said, yes, I laid my hands on him and I could hear her. She I wanted him to know he was very ill. Um, in fact, his disease was terminal and she wanted to, him to know that he had much more time ahead. He, in his mind, which <clears throat> he didn't share with his sister or anyone else, thought that this was his, that he was going to pass away in the hospital. And she wanted him to know he was gonna go home and he had much more time ahead of him. And so that was the message that I passed on to him. And they both burst out crying and it was a really lovely experience. So now when beings on the other side approach me, which I do have a strict rule, only nine to five Monday through Friday, <laughs> because I have to have a life too. I've been approached in restaurants and coffee shops and I've followed through, but it's very disjointing for me and sometimes complete strangers. So that was my very first experience. Well, that's a doozy <laughs> first experience. My goodness. Uh, and it, you, you tell it so beautifully because as you're talking, I mean, I could feel, I don't even know how to describe the physical sensation that I was feeling as you're talking, but it almost felt like my chest was really expanding. And, and uh, I, I don't even know what that's about, but thank you for sharing that story. That was, that was very, uh, very powerful. I, I really appreciate that. So, so now your ability to communicate with uh, those who are no longer physical. Uh, this, I, I love that you make them make an appointment between this and I, hours. Yeah. 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 So, so how does working with them actually help with your clients' healing? Mm. Well, it, you know, it still surprises me today because that was over 20 years ago, that event. And I've had a full-time practice for that amount of time and no longer, I haven't worked in the hospital for 20 years. Uh, I'm so surprised and shocked how much pain and sorrow and how much people miss their loved ones. I've always had a very different perception about life and death, but I also haven't lost people that I have really deep emotional bonds with. You know, I've lost family members, but not people I've had really deep emotional bonds with. So, um, hearing what their loved one has to say is extremely comforting to people. And it, 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 the energy just goes into their body and starts to transform their frequency and their vibration. And there are things that usually make no sense to me. Like sometimes, and I'm sure other mediums feel this way too, what I'm about to translate to this human that I'm talking to from the other side makes no sense to me. And sometimes I kind of dismiss it because it just seems so weird but luckily the universe is wise enough to show it to me in numerous amounts of times so I do repeat exactly what they share with me and then the person on the other end the human is so surprised and they know it. there's no way I could know that and that it's something so deep and personal and important for them I think it helps them to trust me more it allows their loved one who's on the other side who do want to be very helpful you know loved ones on the other side don't need our help other than they need mediums to translate for them until we all learn how to do that for ourselves which is truly the future of humanity uh, and so they're really here to help their departed I mean they're fully physical um, formed friends and family members, and they don't have to. Free will is the strongest law in the universe. So when a loved one who's deceased decides to be of help, they really know how to help because they know that person so incredibly well, and they can see their past lives and their future lives. Because once you're on the other side, the amount of information that you 
know and can know, because some people choose not to, not everybody wants to be of help or not everybody wants to know everything, but the majority of people do, or beings, I should say, because you're a being by then, you're not a human anymore. Um, they uh, are so compassionate and loving and life affirming and their energy just hits their human friend so deeply that it creates amazing transformation. It's powerful. It's, I, I am so grateful that that gets to be a part of the work I get to do. Yeah. You said something really interesting about uh, the future of humanity. And I want to ask you about that in a minute. But first, I want to rewind just a touch to uh, your first story of the young man who thought he was about to buy the ticket. He was about to, to depart. And his mother told him that you have longer to stick around. And I know that this is just conjecture, supposition, but what do you suppose would have happened if you had not listened to his mom, if you hadn't found him and given him this message? Do you think he might have gone ahead and expired too soon just because he thought he was going to? No, I don't think so. I That's such a great and important question. And one of the things I hope the world, but especially Americans learn is to have better understanding of death and, and what's happening why we're here and when we go and why we go before we in, reincarnate into the physical realm. Cause most people have been here many times before even young souls have been here many times before we choose how and when we want to go. We're really not afraid of death when we're outside of the physical realm. We don't believe in it because energy can't be destroyed and we're in a full energy frequency more so than when we're in the physical reality. So we have five exit routes that are imprinted into the scroll of each lifetime. So whenever I say a lifetime, I see a scroll and it unravels like a blueprint and it shows me all kinds of information because I can see past lives. Um, so you have one particular exit route that you hope you choose because when you, before you reincarnate, everyone sits down at a round table. That's what I see. So let's say before you reincarnated, Lisa, you were sitting down at a round table with your spirit guides that you chose. They had to agree because free will is so important in all of the cosmos. You pick these people who you believe are beings that are wiser than you and more evolved than you. And you past lives and creation is there or God, angels, whatever you want to call it, all this high vibrational energy, because it's a really cool and interesting moment to incarnate into a contractual time-space reality like Earth. It's a, a limited reality, but it, it provides so many opportunities because we have so much contrast here. So you really get to if you want to hone in on desires and things that you don't want to have. And because it's so obvious, imagine when you're in the non-physical reality, you don't have to eat, you don't have to go to the bathroom, you don't have to pay a mortgage. So you don't have as much force to kind of perfect who you are and what you want to experience, but you do here on earth, it's pretty clear. So you, with your buddies, your round table people, you come up with these plans. I mean, you, Lisa, you would have been the deciding factor in any decisions that are made and free will is huge. So once you get to earth, you can change your mind about all kinds of things. That's why you have five potential exit routes. So let's say someone didn't want to live a long lifetime. And one of the reasons why they wanted to incarnate was to feel really loved and adored as a child. Maybe they've had a lot of past lives where their family wasn't very loving or they were adopted or they were orphaned. And we tend to repeat a lot of our wounds somewhat trying to heal them. So maybe a soul said, I'm gonna go to earth this time. I'm not gonna live very long, but I wanna be born to a family that just loves me and is gonna miss me to pieces <laughs> you know? so I can heal this wound. So they come to earth and it, let's say they decide with that main particular departure and they leave it at a young age, like three or four years of age, and they can still feel their family loving them and missing them when they're on the other side and it just heals them. And it just, they just heal those wounds. They finally feel worthy and deserving. So there's really good reasons when and how and why people leave their bodies when they do. And it's up to the soul. So even our human personality is not in charge. Our our loved ones are not in charge. Our soul, which is huge and enormous and extremely powerful and wise and is having multiple lifetimes at one time. So our soul is um, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so many questions bursting <laughs> out of my head. Um, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't address the fact that uh, you you said that, uh, and, and I agree from, from my understandings, is that the a, a child who leaves 
uh, what we would consider early, uh, you know, could, for example, have that specific uh, desire in mind. But let's talk about the parents of yeah. that child, because I know parents who've lost children and it's, it's the most horrendous it feeling is. on earth. But how, how can parents come to grips with the fact that at some level of consciousness, they agreed to be the loving parent who mourns the child. Right. I know when you're in that position, that's so hard to hear. And it's, it makes you I very know. angry. <laughs> well, believe me when I've, I've had every kind of client you could possibly imagine. And I've talked to people who've lost all kinds of children. And luckily when I'm in the front of a, of a person, most of the time, like 99% of the time, I know what they need to hear. I know how I need to approach it. And so I wouldn't necessarily say exactly what I said to you um, if that were the situation, if that was their energy, right? right? So it has a lot to do with awareness. Now, parents, parental units, we all choose a parental unit before we incarnate into the physical realm. So we may not choose the exact people like Mary and Fred, but we say to our round table people, hey, uh, I want to learn this next time. I'm going to, I want to leave early. I need a parental unit that is also going to need that experience. So people who have loss early in life, whether they lose a parent when they're young or they lose a child when their child is young, you know, any type of loss like that is because those individuals, the parents or the children who lost their parents when they were young, they want to learn a very important aspect. And that is they want to learn to surrender and let go and get out of the way. And so lo losing parents when you're young or losing a child when you're young, that's the only way you can truly recover from the loss is you have to learn to let go. You have to learn to trust. You have to learn to get out of the way. And it's a hard thing to learn, but imagine we're talking about beings who come to earth uh, as they progress in their soul age, they want to learn powerful and amazing things so that they can become more like their authentic God self or universal self. So learning to let go is a really important aspect of consciousness and evolution. So that's what they want to learn. And that's why I wish we would have these conversations really early in childhood. Like I had all these conversations with my children when they were young, because I just naturally know these things for some weird odd reason. <laughs> and it, we, we had a lot of loss in our family friends. And when my children were quite young, they went to all the funerals. One of my kids saw one of our loved ones after a funeral, when we were at a home, she was probably seven. And she goes, mom, I saw uncle Abbas. He was walking in the front yard while we're all in here eating food, you know, and talking about him. I go, oh, good job, honey. So I think one of the things that will happen as we evolve and expand is when you start to get curious about these concepts, because no one should force these concepts on themselves. You know, they need to be comfortable. They need to feel good. They need to feel ins inspiring because when you grow authentically, we grow through inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we can allow ourselves to invite our awareness to move into these new ideas, then we're going to allow ourselves to become multi, more multi-sensory so that you can see your loved ones. So you can see a friend or a child or a parent that has passed or hear them or feel them because that is beyond the veil amazing. Mm -hmm. To do something like that, you feel um, energized, you feel at peace, it, it, you can't discount that experience, no matter whom you've lost. Right, right. Well, uh, let's let's go ahead and talk about the the future of humanity because you're just sort of touching on that again. Uh, how do you see that unfolding in relation to us becoming multi sensory and uh, our relationship with the other side? Do you think that this is sort of a natural progression for humanity? I do. I absolutely do. I've always believed that I'm, besides all the things that I do in the world, I'm also a, a teacher to help healers learn to heal, you know, which to me, those are people who are multisensory. Um, so yes, I think it's normal as we become more conscious, as we become um, more uh, curious and, not, and become less resistant and start to realize that resistance is not something that should make us stop 
but it should make us more curious. When we feel resistance in our body about something like, oh, I can't go there. It's actually saying, come over here, come over here. It's okay, just sit down, relax, it's all right, try it on. So we're getting better at that, actually. I mean, people like myself and you, we get to have careers in parts of awareness that people couldn't have careers previously. And we're very lucky and fortunate and we're not the only ones. So we know that it's moving in a beautiful way into the human reality and more and more people as they begin to look at all of their life. And I, I really think even most recently because more people have been working from home and realizing that they like that potentially. And corporations are recognized that people are productive when they work from home. That's helping us to relax some of our resistance. People aren't getting in cars and driving for 30 to 90 minutes a day. They're able to eat the food that they want fresh out of the refrigerator, walk their dog. They're able to sleep in, wear their pajamas. Like I, I have bare feet on right now. I only curled the front of my hair. <laughs> you know, So I'm, I'm saving time, enjoying myself and having more time with that with my being, which a lot of people are thankfully able to do, which is helping people to go, do I like my job? Hmm, what else could I do? We're starting to move into curious ways because what we're meant to have all the time is happiness and joy as much as possible. That's normal for humanity. So as we begin to allow ourselves to individuate, to become our beautiful, powerful individual selves, which you can do more in the privacy of your home than you can in a large building with wall-to-wall -wall carpet and uh, small, tiny desks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I am totally on the same page with you. I've seen the the, the same thing where, in in spite of the fact that we're witnessing. I don't even have the words to describe, but we all know what we're witnessing, but there is a light at the end of the, the, this very dark tunnel that there are some good things that are coming from this. And you, I think you really uh, explained beautifully one big aspect of it is how we're changing as human beings and how we show up in the world and, and our boundaries as to what we will allow in our lives and and whatnot but i'm getting off topic i i, <laughs> I want to interview you not talk about my own thoughts now what i wanted to ask is your initial story of the mother in the ceiling <laughs> just coming at you and not letting go that's not how it happens for most people so <laughs> if somebody's relatively new to this you know they might start having an inkling that I might be getting messages and those aren't just my thoughts and daydreams. So how, how do you recognize when someone from the other side is trying to connect with you and how can you sort of hmm, assure that you really are getting information that it's not just thoughts or daydreams or songs stuck in your head? Yeah, although songs stuck in your head can be the universe communicating with you, honestly, especially if it's a song that you haven't heard in a long period of time and all of a sudden it jumped in your brain that I would absolutely pay attention to. I think some of the important things to look at is humanity needs to stop listening to their brain. The, the human mind was created to help us do things in the moment. Like you and I checked and made sure we had a glass of water for ourselves before we went live. Um, I turned off my phone. Um, I actually got on Zoom and looked at myself first before I logged on to you to make sure the lighting looked good. Our, that is what our brain is created to do is to help humans function and move through every day in the highest frequency with the best outcome possible. Uh, the brain is, was not created to analyze and process previous or future information, but yet that is how most human beings use their mind continuously throughout the day. So first learning to be present because you need to have your frequency elevated because all the beings on the other side are in a much higher frequency reality than we are. There, it is, feels amazing over there. So if you can be happy, and so if somebody it wants to talk to a loved one, first of all, they need to not think about missing them, which is hard. You know, you want to talk to your loved one, but you have all this grief. So you have to basically distract yourself. All psychics learn to distract themselves, that we have to learn to actually become present. We can't let our minds focus on um, previous things or future things. We have to literally become present. So paying attention, especially to the lower half of your body. If you're hearing a song or you think someone's nearby, um, sit somewhere 
quickly, go find a place to sit that's quiet and wiggle your toes for like 30 seconds or up to a minute. Maybe even place your hands on your lower abdominal area. And if you're, if you are sitting down, which I would recommend, um, allow yourself to feel your glute muscles where you're sitting, because that really is your present moment. You're sitting, you have toes, you're wiggling them, you're feeling them. So it's distracting you from your mind. And the present moment is actually a fun and happy place. Although most people don't spend any time there whatsoever during the day. And then I think uh, if you do that for a couple minutes, you're going to start to get the clarity that, oh my gosh, I am hearing something. Oh my gosh, I am feeling something. You might have an instant memory of someone who's passed, like a moment when you're in the kitchen frying chicken or a, a vacation that you all had together. That's another way the universe communicates. It will give you spontaneous, instant um, memories of events that already occurred with someone that you loved that was very delicious and fun for you. So actually receiving information from the universe is really simple. A lot of people who don't have a lot of experience in the multi-sensory world try to make it complicated and try to use their brain to translate intuitive information, but, but the brain can't do that. So you have to get quiet, get in your body, think of something happy, distract yourself and see what happens. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, then let's go back to the example of, uh, I, I, I hesitate to keep bringing this up because I know this is one of the most painful things a human can experience. But again, the parent who's lost the child, you said that to communicate, you have to stop yeah. missing them because then the grief gets in the way. So it feels what you're saying is that if uh, the parent can really embrace just such happy, giggly memories that that opens the, the pathway for their child to sort of reach across the veil well, the and, and make that connection. The child's always reaching. Everyone's always reaching. That's not a problem. It, the problem is we need to have the human being being in the right vibration and frequency so that they can see what is in front of them or hear it or feel it. And I'm not saying they have to do that all the time. Grief is an important aspect. We all have it. We all need to experience it. We all need to release it. But if they could just have moments what would it be like? Which I think is actually healthy in the grieving process anyway, to have a moment of pure joy. And maybe if it is the, a parent of a child, it would be best if they not think of the mem happy memories of the child. They need to think of other things. You really have to distract yourself because if you keep lowering your frequency, and imagine it this way, your loved one is up here. Ah you know, in this high vibrational energy, earth is already a low frequency reality. It is one of the lowest vibrational realities in all of the cosmos. That's why when some clients or students say to me, what about the scary things, you know, out outside of the earth realm? I go, no, this is the scariest place. <laughs> this is it. There's nothing scary out there. And this is it. And I love it here, you know? So if you love it here and you enjoy it here, all the better, because that keeps your frequency elevated. So what you want to do, and this is why we call, why we're called mediums, is because we work in the middle, right? The, the loved one on the other side lowers their energy as much as they can, which is, there's a limit because they're not in physical form and they're not going to come into physical form anytime soon. It takes a while to reincarnate. And then the uh, human has to heighten their frequency so that we can meet in the middle and the human can hear or see or feel their loved one's communication and remember that loved one has looked at their scrolls of their previous lifetimes and their future lifetimes and is fully um, understanding what they need to hear, what would be in their best interest, how they could best help them. And so if we can get in that spot, then that can really accelerate the healing and the letting go, um, I think, because once we really understand the truth that our loved ones are not dead, they've just moved you know, to a different place of existence. It's like if someone you know moved to China and you're not going to see them, who knows, for years and years and years potentially. That's pretty that that's a far distance, but you feel like, well, I could, I could get on an airplane, I could go see them, I could talk to them on the phone, we could have a Zoom call. Imagine if we meet in the middle and we start to have these experiences, people are going to begin to feel that way about their loved ones, which will be wonderful for all of us, no matter where we are in the cosmos.
Right, right. Now, another question came up as you were talking about how uh, their vibration is here and they need to lower it so that it's closer to where we're coming. And as you were talking about that, you said that, you know, they, they can't become physical, at least not, you know, without being born again, but uh, they, they're this close. And they're not physical, but sometimes as you saw the mother or, or uh, your child saw the uncle, how is it that they can be seen? Is it only uh, people who are able to receive that kind of information that can actually see their loved ones? How does, well, I'll tell you what my, I'll tell you what my spirit, great questions, by the way. I love these questions. What my spirit guides told me years ago when I realized I was a medium, I'm like, okay, this is weird. Why am I a medium? I don't understand this. And I go, and how is this happening? And they said, well, um, beings on the other side can tell when someone has a multisensory ability. There's something within our crown chakra that extends through the veil, which by the way, the veil to me looks like a placenta. It's pretty thick membrane actually. And as, as each individual increases their consciousness, the veil thins for that person. So we want as much of humanity, although we can't force it, but to um, increase their awareness and their consciousness because the, then the veil will thin for everyone on the planet or more people will reach that tipping point, which we're getting pretty close to, by the way. So for whatever reason, the veil is very thin for me. And then my crown chakra extends through the veil and then beings on the other side can see that I'm multisensory. They can also see how I work. So apparently when a loved one wants to talk to a client of mine, which they will know about the appointment before I do, or, or even before their person probably makes the appointment because they can see into the future. There's like a reader board. It's probably a hologram, but it, there's a reader board that says, Marie does not hear names because it's true. I People do not look like their names to me in human form. So I don't hear names even on the other side. It's extremely rare when I do, but I'm highly visual. I, I will be able to see what their loved one looks like. I will be able to describe their mannerisms what kind of clothing they wear. So the beans on the other side, and I'm also auditory. So they'll know that they can talk to me and they can show me images um, so that I will be able to understand so I can then translate it to their loved ones. So that's how it works. And so people on the other side or beans on the other side, they read these reader boards about an individual and then they know how to move the energy so that we can see them, hear them and feel them. Like some people don't see the loved ones, I see them very close to the time of their passing. And I will describe, I always see their hair first for some weird reason, but I do like hair. Um, and height is not my best ability, um, but I will, I can see their entire body and their clothes and things like that. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that explanation, because that sort of explains why some people can see them and others hear. Uh, personally, I, I get the best messages when I'm using tools like oracles, et cetera. But sometimes I'll, I'll hear messages and I'm like, okay, I know that's not my thoughts. I can, I can sense a difference in the energy uh, that that's not me. So thank you for explaining how that works. But you, you mentioned uh, the crown chakra and the thinning of the veil. And thank you for that, because I was going to ask you, how, how do you define the veil? And that, that was a beautiful explanation. But I've also heard you say elsewhere, something about how the first chakra is the only one that leaves the energy system of someone who died. Can you explain yeah. that? So when we incarnate into the physical realm, the root chakra, when a baby is born, is the last one to emerge. Um, because we the root chakra, the first chakra, the opposite of the seventh, uh, helps us to ground to this physical reality. It has also many more complexities to it, which are very fascinating, which I use in my work. And maybe I'll be able to mention a little bit about that. And it actually takes a full childhood for it to be completely developed. So the first chakra isn't even completely developed until a child moves out of the house. Interesting enough, it takes about 18 years for it to fully become completely uh, usable, which is amazing to me, right? And it's only needed for earth. So when you when our energy leaves our physical form, we don't need a root chakra anymore because we're not gonna anchor to a physical reality. We're going off into a non-physical reality and we don't need to be anchored to anything actually. Hmm. Okay. Isn't that interesting? We don't eat, 
We don't go to the bathroom. We don't work. We don't pay taxes. It's a bit, you don't need a car. You don't need a home. In fact, a lot of people, at least in the fifth dimension, which is the other side for our human existence for earth, don't even partner because you feel so much. You don't get lonely. You don't need touch. You don't have skin that needs to be caressed or held. Um, Sex is very different um, on the other side. In fact, my guides always tell me, make sure you have some, a good time before you cross because I guess sex in the human body is really amazing <laughs> compared to not having a human body. At least this is what my guides tell me. <laughs> so um, does that answer your question? It does. And of course, brings up so many others because you just mentioned something I've never heard anybody talk about. What? Let's talk about what is the difference between uh, the physical sexual experience and non-physical? I can only imagine because my guides have, you know, either I haven't been curious enough about the question right, to ask because I'm like, I'm in a body right now. I'm like, uh, you know, I, I, I love to be present. It's one of my favorite things. Um, it's definitely, from what I can tell, it's probably more like being uh, on psychedelics or something like that. It's very multiple, you know, conscious kind of experience, but it's not very tactile, right? right? So in the human form, it's very visceral, right? It's, it's really intense. I mean, wonderful, loving, you know, kind, compassionate, uh, you know, wonderful sex is just it's mm -hmm. lovely. It's, it, it hits a lot of the, the beautiful bases that we want to experience in the physical reality, mm -hmm. but it's very different in the non-physical. It doesn't have that physical tactile um, experience. Right, right. Yeah, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, the from my understanding, the reason that we become physical is to feel the, the yes. sensual experience of being physical. So, so yeah, that, that, that answer is, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, so, Oh, we're running low on time, doggone it. I could talk to you for days. Um, but let me ask you first, um, when somebody does cross, we've talked a, a bit about you know, what happens before you come in, the, the meetings, the agreements that you make, but when you actually depart, uh, there's, there's the life review that we've heard about. Um, in your eyes, how do people regain clarity about their most recent lifetime? Yeah, that's a great question. So we live in the third dimensional space. There's another dimension between earth and the other side. I call it the fourth dimension. Many people call it the astral plane or the psychic realm. So a lot of mediums actually stand in the fourth dimension energetically and then loved ones as they're translating, come stand in the fourth dimension as well and allows for this communication, but it can happen multiple different ways. But to answer your specific question, when someone leaves their body, some people just fly from the physical world, rocket through the astral plane and jump into the other side. And in fact, a fair amount of people do actually just fly over. And then there's a percentage of people who um, maybe they didn't really do a lot of inner work while they were alive. And some people do inner work if they have a, a long illness. They might do inner work, especially if they're sleeping a lot. They might do a lot of inner work while they're here in the physical world that prepares them so that they can just fly over. But there's some people who just are shocked, honestly, and confused in like a car accident where you die instantly that could cause someone to go to the astral plane and, and be a little bit shocked, like, am I dead? What happened, right? And so it could take them a period of days, weeks, months, sometimes years, but that's a very small category before they cross over to the other side. And, and so they, those in the astral plane who are a little confused are actually experiencing, they keep looking at earth and, and they, they um, many of them want to get back to earth, but they can't. <laughs> you know? And, and so they, um, I'll tell you a story. I had a client, she is now deceased. And she, when she came to see me, she had um, terminal cancer. And I told her, I didn't think she was going to survive because I'm very honest with my clients. Um, and, and I told her that so that she wouldn't keep coming back to me to, and, and, and wouldn't have to pay, you know, um, monies for my work because I didn't see her surviving, but she kept coming back anyway. And um, she was, worked full time, even though she was so sick, I was trying to get her to retire, quit your job, you know, like enjoy your life. And she wouldn't. And she kept telling me, oh, I'm going to survive this. You're going to be wrong. And I go, I would love to be wrong. I would 
absolutely love to be around. And um, after a while, she ended up being at home on hospice and her husband called me. She lived on one of the islands here in the San Juans. And he said, could you please just come and be at the bedside with her? I said, I would love to. So I went over, I'm at the bedside with her. She's getting last right. She's still yelling at us all that she's not dying. <laughs> you know? And she died a couple of days later. And I saw her flying around my house in the astral plane for about a year, kind of mad at me. You know, but I loved it. I, I never get scared with any of this. I find it fascinating. And I would just blow her kisses. I was just delighted to see her flying around and being annoyed, you know, because I knew she was where she needed to be to work out whatever she needed to work on so that she could cross over. Her family and friends were waiting for her, waving, sending her beams of light. And she just wants to fly around and kind of be angry. <laughs> I think a lot of times, we die the way we lived, you know, and that's why consciousness is so important. It's a very personal experience to become aware. And that's how we learn to let go. And that's how we learn to recognize our own resistance and do whatever amount of healing we can do in the physical reality. But in truth, it doesn't matter when or how we heal, even if it takes all of us each 400,000 lifetimes to figure something out, it doesn't matter. We are always loved, adored and cherished and helped in every capacity from the divine and the multisensory world. But anyway, hopefully that story helped a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I love your stories. I, again, bringing up so many more questions. So I'm wondering, was it her anger that kept her stuck between the, the, the worlds? Uh, how, how do, is there any way that uh, we, the living can help uh, I don't know. I don't like to use the word ghosts, but at this moment, I can't yeah. come up with anything better. Yeah. It's the anger. What kept her stuck, I guess, was it. And the it was question. the anger that created her disease too. Right. So, right. Um, and she wasn't, con she wasn't considered a ghost because she knew that she was in between worlds. Ghosts who are make up about 3% of those who leave their bodies, you know, who die, they don't know they're in between worlds. They're confused, you know, and they, very few of them will try to be mischievous or create problems, very few. And when they do, unfortunately, they get kind of attracted to people who may not be mentally stable or be in a time in their life where things have just been very chaotic, <clears throat> excuse me, or difficult for them. And, and then that kind of creates a scary situation, right? But that's such a small percentage of being. So she was aware, she just wasn't ready. And it's okay, you can stay in the astral plane all you want and fly around and experience all kinds of cool, interesting things. It's a huge, vast time-space reality. I always compare it to, it's bigger than earth, um, a 20 lane, 20 tiered highway with every color car you could possibly imagine moving at light speed down these highways. It's a very fast. And that's why sometimes um, people who have psychic abilities, but maybe aren't grounded in their body, have a hard time perhaps translating or understanding what's going on because the astral plane is so quick and working on the lower chakras and being really in that foundational part of ourselves is highly necessary as we become multi-sensory beings, which we are, but allow ourselves to be that. Right, right. Well, I'm going to squeeze in one more question, even though we're this close to out of time, because you keep coming up with these amazing things. Now, you, let's talk about uh, a bit about that, that 20 lane multi-tiered highway. Where would that be between the physical world, the veil and the, beyond the veil? Where are we looking at? Uh, so good. It's right next to you. It's like probably... It's, it's a dimension that um, connects to your auric field, especially the sixth layer of your aura, which I call the psychic field. The third eye intervates into the astral plane. So it's really right next to us. We're walking into each other's worlds all the time. And then the other side is only three feet away from the human body. So there are hundreds and thousands of time-space realities, or I should say realities, because time is an illusion. Um, but these three are the ones I focus on, and that's one way to understand where they are, but I bet there's so many, they're just sandwiched on top of each other, and they're, they're reached by frequency and vibration, right? Mm. Yeah. All right. Wow. 
overload. <laughs> <laughs> so much fascinating information. Uh, uh, before I get distracted any further, I want to make sure that I mention your website for anyone who wants to uh, be in touch with you or, or look at your work. Uh, you've got energyintuitive.com and then your radio show, the Marie Manucherry Show dot podbean dot com uh if they go to energyintuitive.com what will they find there well you can find all the radio stuff as well i've been doing radio for about 14 years so i have hundreds of podcast shows i do answer people's questions i've also interviewed a lot of interesting people like deepak chopra and um lisa oz and all kinds of interesting people and not famous people too who are um lovely uh, um you can i'm doing a retreat in greece next year um about manifesting i do a, i do my best to do an international retreat once a year and then i teach a bunch of online courses and i'm now a faculty member of the shift as well and have something wonderful coming up um this fall absolutely wow well gosh marie i I really, I could just keep you on the line for hours, but I know you've got other things to do. So um, I want to ask before we do go, I'm sure there's things we've left out. I'm sure there's other places we can go, but is there anything just sort of rattling around in your brain that needs to come out before we wrap it up? Yes. And it may seem unrelated, but I promise it's not. One of the ways to allow our vibration to expand and to become the multi-sensory beings that we all would love to be and we're ready for is to fall deeply in love with yourself. Ignore the definition of ego in every dictionary on the planet. It is incorrect. We are meant to feel that we are beautiful, handsome, incredible, genius beings, because that is the truth of our existence. Beautifully stated. And thank you again, Marie. This has been just a delightful conversation. I so appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I love your questions. They were amazing. <laughs> and I loved your answers. Uh, once again, I want to remind everybody, I've been talking with Marie Manucherry, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this conversation in the Beyond the Veil Summit.